Jirat Allah Khair Imam Ahmad Salid So our last session is going to be This one is going to be our last session and our speaker is Dr. Ramzi Muhammad uh, Dr. Ramzi Muhammad is part of this community mashallah for decades uh, He was born in Iraq He has PhD in Oncology and Hematology He is Professor of Oncology at Wayne State University He served IATD for as a um, Sunday school principal in the past and these days he is serving Unity Center Sunday School. Uh, Dr. Ramzi Muhammad. How much time? Uh, oh, that's good. It's not a lecture. <laughs> It's not a lecture. I am going to ask you questions you about uh, your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, uh, no Google, please. No Google. <laughs> so, it's a quick announcement. Take so, it from my time. So, young brothers and sisters, those who are in the back, we have a youth parallel session going on in the men's prayer hall. You can attend that session as well. Jazakallah. <coughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه الطاهرين الطيبين. Thank you very much for inviting me. And as I said, uh, it's not a lecture. It's a more interacting session, and we want to know uh, things about our Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. So I'm going to ask, and if you have the answer, you will be the lecturer, inshallah. Before I start. <coughs> Because I uh, work in research for 37 years, so I'm going to teach you two tricks today. We are sitting here, and a lot of doctors here, a lot of professionals. If you notice yourself, you're breathing. We are not breathing at all. We are taking very little of oxygen. So my advice, and I'm doing this, you go outside and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you are living in America because I lived in Qatar four years and a half. I cannot go outside, 128 <laughs> degrees. And if you, if you breathe there, you die. So here, you go outside, you see the lungs, what we are doing here, we are 10%, 15%, 70%. How about the rest? You go and take deep breath, but not fast, because if you take it fast, you're going to be dizzy. And hold it for one, two, three, four. Do it every day with this wonderful weather, you lose weight. <laughs> Second. Thank you. What do we have not breathing? Oxygen. You want me to give a lecture on oxygen? Very important. All these oxidative reactions. We are not doing that. The blood needs oxygen. We are taking little. Second. How many of you pray Fajr prayer? Yeah, all of them, mashallah. And the Pakistani prays more than the Arabs. <laughs> <laughs> I used to teach in Canton for, I don't know, maybe 15 years. I was the principal there. Here, I don't know, maybe 12 years. Now the Arabs call me Ramzi the Indo-Pak. <laughs> so I say, okay, I'm going to serve you one year. Those are shaitans. Those are the boys, the Arabs. One Arab child equal to ten in the Pakistan. <laughs> Wallahi, they are like crazy. I could not increase the size of the, of the class. So I put two teachers. The second important thing is boiling water. Every time before you pray Fajr, take a cup, put it in the microwave for one minute, one minute and a half, only water, drink it. Three weeks, diabetes goes down, cholesterol goes down, cardio, everything. Lose weight, 
what's happening is with this boiling water you are drinking, don't put coffee or tea. My wife cheat, cheated, but what she puts coffee or... No, no, because caffeine is bad. You drink it, and then you go pray, and then come and eat. It would dissolve all the dead cells, you know. The digestive system, we have so many dead cells. We have so many fat cells. We have so many mucus. It's all about. I'm not a, I'm a researcher, a cancer researcher. So this is enough, two, two is enough. Let's go about the lecture. Michael Hart, you know who's Michael Hart? A writer, big writer. He's not a Muslim. He spent 28 years to write a book. What was the title of the book? About Muhammad? No. The hundred, the hundred, the hundred ranking of the most important persons in entire history. And he chose Muhammad Sallallahu And he was giving the lecture in London. And they told him why. Some of them were opposing. Who is this Muhammad? The shepherd, the Arabian. He said, he said, he's not a Muslim. He said, كان شخصا واحدا. He was one person. He stood in Mecca alone. And he said, I am a prophet. Allah sent me to you. How many believed in him? Four. Can you tell me who? Question. Only four. Yalla, 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 don't be. You are attending tw for 20 years lectures. Number one, yes. Khadija, his wife, the first one, second. Abu Bakr, third. Ali Abi Talalib, fourth. This is difficult. Me, Zaid, Zaid ibn Haritha. Four. Michael Hart, he said, one person. Four only believed in him. And now how many million, billion people in the world, Muslims? 1.5, 1.8. In India, maybe more now, they are producing more children in China. He, the whole book, he said, Muhammad is not a liar because a lie cannot live for 100, for 1,400 years. He's, that's the conclusion. He said, he's not a liar. It is not a lie. Second, he cannot, one person, he cannot deceive two billion people. And he said that to that, to that person who, were oppo who was opposing, he said, there are millions of people. If you mention Muhammad, they will say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they will be able and they were willing to sacrifice. Show me one sacrifice, Isa, to, to the cause of Isa or Musa. Zero. He said zero. So, mashallah, this is... Now, Bernaccio, Bernaccio, another, he said, Europa, Europe started now to appreciate the wisdom of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a, a religious person, political, army leader, a family, social, everything, everything. Now, the first world war, how many people died? I'm talking about the leadership of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See, b bad leadership causes problem. We have one in America, I don't know. <laughs> so how many people died in the uh, first world war? Huh? Come on. Come on. More. Statistics says up to 70 million. 70 million. Why? Because of the bad leadership. You know, Hitler and Mussolini, Rosenfeld and Churchill kill each other. A lot of Muslims got killed. How many people among us, how many, what's the statistic that a leader, percentage, give me a percentage, a leader will, bo will be born? Yes? One person. How many people they are born 
and they cannot leave. One person. 98? We are like in the 98 percentile percentage. We can leave if we study and somebody teach us. But natural leader is one person. Who are the best army leaders in the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You know him. Khalid ibn Walid. But the second most important, they call him Dahiyatul Arab, the genius of the Muslims and Arab, Umar ibn al-As. He, he was, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, you were born a leader. So let's see what this Umar, Umar ibn al-As, he was the, of course, the wali of Egypt. And he, so I have a little story about him. Umar ibn al-As, he came victorious from very important Islamic battle, that is Salasim. And he was the leader of the whole Muslim army. And he came entering al Medina and he said, where is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Where is the Prophet? He said, he is sitting in the masjid. He said, I will go. And he went with his, you know, army clothes and, and he sat in front of him. And he asked him a question. Qala ya Rasulullah, man ahabu nasu ilayk? Whom do you love most? Look at that. He thought that the Prophet would say, you, because he came victorious and and the Prophet look at look at the yeah, Prophet وسلم, he was so natural. He said, I love my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Aisha. Look at what he said. He said, I'm not asking you about women. <laughs> I'm asking you about men. And the Prophet. Abu her, 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 her father. Abu <laughs> See, he is very, very so he wanted the Prophet ﷺ to tell, to say in front of all Muslims that I love you, Umar ibn As, you came victorious. But look at the, the truthful of the Prophet. ﷺ. So there are there were Sahaba very famous, like Abu Dhar al Ghafari. Abu Dhar al Ghafari, very pious, very knowledgeable. He came to the Prophet. ﷺ. He said, Oh Prophet. Give me position, leadership position. I want to rule. And he looked at him, and immediately the Prophet ﷺ assessed him. He said, "Ya Abadar, inna ha amana wa inna ha yom al qiyamati khizju wa nadama." Oh Abu Bakr, oh Abu Dhar, it's a trust to become a ruler. It's a trust, and in the day of judgment, if you will be so sorry, it is sorrow, and you will regret. You are not fit to be a leader. Abu Dhar, he lived long. He lived, the, the Prophet Muhammad passed away. He lived. Abu Bakr passed away. He lived. Amr ibn Khattab passed away. He lived. And he never, never got any uh, leadership position. We go to Khalid ibn Walid. Is he? He was the best army leader. But if you look at him, so, so Abu Dhar, he was knowledgeable, he was faqih, he was alim, but leadership did not fit him. We go to another person, Khalid ibn Wali, he, he was genius, he was a very good leader, army leader. But when he used to lead in the prayer, the whole army of Muslims, he used to make mistakes, he's not a half of, and he jumps. From one ayah to another ayah in the Quran. And he when when he finished the salah, he said, Shagalan jihad an al Quran. Fighting the enemy took me away from Hamz of Quran. But the Prophet was depending on him. Although he's not hafid, he is not faqih. So what I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that there is no connection between you are scholar and faqih, you have to be a leader. No. If the leader is good leader and has faqah, that's fine. How about the, uh, the age? There is no connection between age and leadership. Can you give me a hand? 
Usama. Usama. Usama bin Uzayd, 17 years old. The Prophet sallallahu he looked at Usama. is a natural born leader. And he gave him the leadership. Under his command was Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar ibn Khattab. And he is 17 years old. Where are our youth? Where are my children? Wallahi, we are suffering here in America. I know. He's working somewhere. But alhamdulillah, yani we try. We try. It, it's very hard. I have four children. I say, I wish they remain kids and children. When they grow up, there are problems to grow up with them. This is a very dangerous society. But what can we do? Now, how about uh, leadership in women? Give me, a, give me a good example from the Quran. Wallah, if you don't know. Yes, sister. Yes? Saba, yes, very good. Malikat Balqis. The, the queen Balqis. She was the queen of Yemen. And she was so uh, smart, she did not fight uh, Sayyidina or uh, the Prophet uh, who? And she became Muslim at that. And amazingly, amazingly, Quran did not say that when she became a Muslim, she, she wasn't the queen. That's that's something. The other thing, th this is the, the cream of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. They came to him. Ahmed bin Hanbal, he was the Imam. He said, they said to him, we have two people and we want one of them to be a leader. One, he's very strong physically, but he's a sinner. He is strong and he has a good leadership, but he's fasuk, sinner. He is not a committed Muslim. Sometimes praise, sometimes don't, sometimes. And he said, what's the second? The second, he is weak, has no, no leadership, but if you lose him, you find him in the masjid. It's very taqi, taqi. And the answer, maybe you know the answer like, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Well, what do you think? He said. Whom he chose? The first one. Second? Second, he is going to take the whole Muslim army and... <laughs> he, he said. The first one. أَمَّا الْفَاجِرُ الْقَوِي قُوَّتُهُ لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ وَفُجُورُهُ لِنَفْسِهِ He is strong. He is a leadership. This is what the Muslims want. But he is fasid, he is fajid, he is sinner. That's between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't care. Let him be victorious. Let him win the battle. Let him lead the Muslims. So, أَمَّا الضَّعِيفُ الْقَوِي أَمَّا الضَّعِيفُ التَّقِي And he said the, the weak, but he is biased and faqih. This is for him good. But he is not a good leader for Muslims. He will damage. Now, John Edler, Alam Baritani, he's a British. He said he is, he has 50 books about leadership. Most of his books taken from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He said there are two main things that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has. And this is the heart of leadership. What are those two? Huh? Say it if you know. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had two things. He, he is the, this is the John Adir, fifty books. He is specialized, mutakhassis fi qiyada. He is specialized in leadership. And one of his books is leadership of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Number one is Sayyid al Qawmi Khadimuhum. The master of the people, the leader of the people, is the servant of the people. He serves the community. He loves his community. You know, second, 
protect his community. You dafa an hukukum. Those are the two things. If you have this, according to Mr. John, that is the leadership of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who has, he serves and he protects. Now, we in Iraq, we used to study about the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you in Pakistan, and India, and everywhere. All what he did is, Ma'arakat Badu, Ma'arakat Uhud, Ma'arakat Al-Khanda. What is this? How many, what is the percentage of his life that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 63 years. How many percentage of his life he was an army leader or he was involved in a battle? Tell me. 7%. 7%. 93%. Nobody teaches about 93 Where are the, uh, the research centers of Muslims? This is why we see ISIS and Daesh and all the ISIS and Daesh. You know, my, Muslim, my city Muslim, if you looked at it, go to the website, it is worse than, than Berlin in the, in the war with it was collapsed, destroyed completely. And this is all, it's a, it's a, it's a play. Anyways, 93% we don't study. Now, I want to just tell you how much time. See, nobody also teaches his life before he became prophet. Very, very important. I go fast before he became prophet. Lam yaqra kitab fi hayatihi. He never read a book in his life. He cannot read. Lam yaktub He never wrote one sentence. Lam yar as jama'a. He did not have a party or he wasn't a president or a king or nothing. Lam yakur rajul deen. He wasn't a priest or a rabbi. Lam yakun nabigan. He was not a gifted child. Lam yakun siyasiyan. He wasn't a politician. Lam yakun ghaniyan. He but. They know about Muhammad, he was a Saduq al Amin, trustworthy, truthful. Lam yashrab khamar, he never tested alcohol. Lam yasjud li sanam, he never prostrated to sanam, an idol. He never went to the bar. You know, in Mecca, there are a lot of bars. And there are houses, they have red flag. Do you know what are these? These are full of women. He never entered these houses. He never committed adultery. He never stole anything. He never lied. These are all before even he became a prophet. Subhanallah. Two minutes, three minutes? Finish? Now, I want for me and for the Muslims, especially in America, we have opportunity to think better than the people that I saw back home who are worried about what they're going to eat tomorrow. And you see the children selling cigarettes and candies, and no future, nothing. I go to Washington in the study section and I am maybe the only Muslim. I look around, most of them, Hindus, Indian, second generation. The other part, Chinese, second generation. No accent. I'm the only one with it. What is, where are, where are our children? Man, we are so late. Those people, they control the money in Washington. Our, you know, we have to, to change our thinking and serve Islam. I have always this statement. If you don't volunteer, question your Islam. That's my. Wallahi. All the Sahaba were volunteers. Now enough money, money, money. Come, excel. This is America. I give you two examples and 
these two examples, you're going to answer me, of course, this is a question. It will open your mind and you can apply this in your life. So, we are all Muslims and then if somebody comes and he said, non-Muslim or any, any person will ask you, how do, how do a Muslim sleep? Immediately. Well, he make wudu, he, 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 he sleep on his right, he put his, his hand under his cheek, he reads Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, he reads Al uh, Mu'awadatin, he... This is what our shiyukh taught us. But these are all nothing except adab, etiquette. What is the most important thing? that we do when we sleep. Forget. I sleep and have no nothing in my heart against any Muslim and non-Muslims. That is Islam wants you. Not see if you don't read, Allah will not punish you in the day of judgment. If you don't put your hands under the chair, Allah will not punish you. If you sleep without wudu, Allah will not. But these are adab. But the real, the heart of the matter is your heart. What is, what is And I, I know I have my evidence, but I don't have time. You know, that my evidence is when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in the masjid and a, 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 a sahabi came and he said, this is, he's among the Jannah. And you know the story. And the, that is it. When he sleeps, he has if I ask you and any ask any Muslim, how a Muslim eat? Well, we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We sit on the ground. We say we eat with three three fingers, and we put and, 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 and we say Alhamdulillah, and, and the food should be higher than you. And what is this the heart of the matter? No, brothers and sisters. What is the heart of the matter in, in eating the food? Your food comes from halal that you did not steal the food. You did not have the food from unlawful source. That is what take you to her fire. Not eating with three hands. These are adab, sitting on the floor. See what was happening with the Muslims here? We are, we are not understanding the ruh, the soul of Islam. I can give you example, hundreds of example. How was salah? Allah, oh, oh no, no, no. You should say, Allah Akbar, then you raise your hand. No, 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 no. You have to put your two fingers here. Okay? And you say, if you put this one on this and hold it. All these adapts. But what is the ruh of the salah? Khushur. And you measure on your life. You see, oh my God, I am mistaken. Our Imam, I don't, I don't want to give example, in, in Qatar. He <laughs> <laughs> will not be here next time. <laughs> <laughs> they will not bring me here. <laughs> I know, we have to exercise the freedom. Thank, 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 thank Allah for this Nama. We have an Imam in Qatar. I want to see him in Salat Salat al Fajr. <laughs> I want to see him in Salat al-Isha, very rare. But, but he's a scholar. When I have a problem in Zakah, in, in Talaq, I go to him. I have to distinguish. Yes, he is Imam, but he is not committed to Salat. That's between him and Allah. But he is very good in knowledge. Now, you see, what are the dangers? I see people, especially the youth, they go inside IIGD and they go to the most humble person. Allah Akbar with the beard, with the everything, read the Quran, and he asks him a question. Come on. You have to ask the man that he doesn't come to the budget because he is knowledgeable. Understand me? So, thank you very much. I think my time is. Uh, this is a great community. I love, I love this community. And inshallah, your future will be bright. Yeah, I mean, uh, shaitan comes, 
but we are stronger than Shetan. You know? And this is why the first day in, in, in Unity Center, I collect, I, I gather the teacher. I say, don't give any lecture about Shaitan. <laughs> don't give any lecture about Adab al Qabr, the punishment of the hellfire. Don't give any lecture about Jim. These are not important things. The important thing is other we have to consider. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nastaghfirak wa natubu ilayk. Wal asri inna al insana fi khusr. Illa ladina amanu wa amu salihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Jazakum Allah khair. So we have almost 15 minutes. We are going to have a quick question and answer session. Uh, Imam Ahmed Saleh, if you can come please. And Dr. Ramdi. Oh, you call me up? Question and answers. Is it? Yeah. You cannot just ask questions to community, right? We, have to, we should have a chance to. By the way, women answer more than men. Mm. <laughs> okay, um, anyone, if, if you have any question, please raise your hands or you can stand up. Go ahead, Kevin. So the question is, how do we raise good Muslims in this society? I think um, there are different ones. One is the role modeling. You as a parent, the role model and uh, ritual. Uh, gather them around the ritual. Of course, the massage should be child friendly. And I even like massage in Texas where they have a cry room. So even from very young, the father is there with the child, the mother is there with the child in the cry room. Um, so I think some of very I remember when I was imam at the mosque in South Africa, my child was just a few days and weeks old and I put him inside the mihrab. And I was worried the president will be upset because sometimes he makes a noise and this is, we are so honored that from birth you are raising your child uh, in the masjid. So keep connected to the masjid, but I think make your home a masjid also. And I, I know a lot of uh, people, the, there's always discussion of religion. Uh, one of the other things is also if you have a mega mosque, uh, see what some of these mega churches are doing. Have six or seven families always connected. So if your child comes to the mosque, they know there's some different friends they're going to go to. So no matter how large the community, 3,000 members, you always have a group of six coming together and they are connecting. Maybe have children at the same age and so they can share the same problems. So role modeling, ritual, routine, have even certain type of... Um, uh, but this whole thing where people say, you know, leave back what's the baggage in the East and just become American, that's completely nonsense. We have a lot of strings, in fact, major strings coming from our own countries, respect for elders, um, a lot of other things that we need to bring back. So be careful how you speak about that. American society to me has a lot of virtue, especially in the Midwest, take the best from that. Um, but I think we also uh, need to protect our children as far as, um, we, we invest a lot more time into our children when, when we are here. Sometimes we in Pakistan, we take it for granted through osmosis, they're going to pick up Islam and they don't. And sometimes our children here are more disciplined than children back home. So, uh, but don't give up here. So now Omar Adhanu says, if you have your child and you give them the right training, even if they go off course, they're going to come back. Some winds are blowing them away, they're going to come back. Give them a good solid base and Allah will do the rest. Welcome. So I always 
say that look at your child, whether it's he or he. The most important thing, I mean, I'm, I'm concentrating on the most important thing. If he or she prays, alhamdulillah. Second, no drug, alcohol, excellent. No girlfriend, boyfriend, khlas. Your child is excellent. Don't see what's happening with our community. We are inserting so many things. They are confused. So if he is praying or she is praying, what do you want more? Remember yourself when you are 14 years, 15 years. Did we pray? I don't remember. No. So why are you expecting? They come back as Imam Talib. They come back. You have, they have a good mother, a good father, they come back when they get married. <laughs> so so what, what destroy your son or daughter is, is, is uh, these things are. Just a quick uh, comment again. From age 14 to 20, our children can really be obnoxious and challenge us. But just uh, write it out, that is uh, very normal. Aged, uh, they think you can teach them nothing. Once they get to 20, 21, oh my God, my father has got all the wisdom, and then they get back to that again. I've got children, sons that are 25, 26, and we are on the phone almost every day, even if they're in South Africa. They FaceTime, they do that. Uh, but you set the proper foundation, I think um, your grandchildren will, will do the same. Uh, no Make sure you touch it on the in of the and being with the Shia. Can you please elaborate on that? How to work with that fine line between xenophobic and there's no place for racism in Islam. Bilal bin Rabah was a black person, he was a free slave. Some describe the Abyssinians as thick lips and kinky hair, you know, flat noses. So you're not going to dis uh, discriminate on the basis of color. You're not going to discriminate on the basis of class. Um, most of the early Muslims were freed slaves and some of the poorest of the poor. Um, white privilege in America is an extremely dangerous thing. And sometimes you find it among academics, you find it at the highest levels. So study white, what white privilege is actually. The way you're going to treat a person, the police person will treat a, a, a white girl when they pull her over. If she's 17 and she makes certain noises, as our comedian said, they like, oh my God, and you have a 17-year-old Caucasian accent, those police will let them uh, off uh, much uh, quicker. Uh, the black boy is always a danger. If anyone who's a person of color, there's always some danger. Uh, those people who do have white privilege, we sometimes turn them into gods, and that's harmful for them. I know when we were here at IGD in 2004, when Jeffrey Lang came here, and Jeffrey Lang says, if a white man comes here with blue eyes and blonde hair, everyone wants to run for his autograph. <laughs> But those black people who have for 30 years been Muslim, we don't run and show the respect for them. Um, so we must get any type of these type of uh, cultural racism. Don't adopt that from America. Go back to the time of the prophets also on the way he treated Bilal, the way he treated uh, his mother Umbi Ayman, the one who raised him in, in many ways. Um, and uh, some of the greatest thinkers in, in, in uh, Islam, like Jahid, were Sudanese people and black people. Yeah, Sister Fabia. Yeah. 
there are many experts on Ottoman history, even Mughal history. One of my favorites is uh, Akbar and how he had uh, very enlightened policies towards agnostic groups and atheist groups in 1580. Um, I think as you go along, maybe email me and text me, we could share some texts that we do have that we trust. Um, the Oxford Islamic Studies database has 6,000 articles. It may be a good start for every mosque to have something like that. Um, and then you take it from there and just uh, go to other scholars that we trust with insider perspectives and let them recommend other critics. There is a very good site. Uh, he is a historian from Egypt. We invite him to America, a Sarjani. Sarjani, he has all Andalus, Malaysia, Indonesia, everything. So, but mostly it's in Arabic. Now they are translating it. A Sarjani. Beautiful question. One more question, I think we're always going to pray. I think that uh, there'd be happy homes, right? If we don't, don't have uh, abusive type of situations, and if we say that the mother, the mother, the mother is great respect, treat those women with the greatest respect. Give your daughters the opportunities that you give your sons in amazing ways, you know. So bring back the principles of Islam that we speak so eloquently and live it. Live it inside your house. Um, but I think just be a compassionate person so that your children want to take you as a friend. Um, I think one of the other problems I have is we send our children off to Ivy League schools and send them to dorms there. What the Turks have, for instance, is at every major university, they get a, a, a house in one of the best areas just for 10 or 12 boys or 10 or 12 girls. So they have the alternatives to sororities and fraternities and give a safe space. You're going to worry about your children till they marry and then worry about their grandchildren again. But just constantly be there for them and uh, be uh, a model good manners and characters and forgiveness. And uh, just give them a solid, solid Islamic Again, in South Africa. Many of those who are doctors are also Hafid al-Quran. Many of those who are engineers are also have Arim program. Bring that uh, together also. We need to have more polyglots. Yes, sir. Can you tell me that I know that she is married and a girl? So the family wants to know whether they should they should pick out the girl or should they be in touch with that girl or how to behave with the girl? How to bring her back in Islam? I think uh, it may be necessary for us. I attended a conference and the conference spoke about sexual disorientation. Now sexual disorientation is a lot of people become gay or lesbian because it's cool to become gay or lesbian or they have been abused when they were young and so they think that they are gay, they're not really gay. Okay, that's maybe a different question. But I, I think our community will have to get together and have groups discussing in the massage in how to deal with this issue. Um, I don't have the answer for you right now. How to deal with the daughter? So she's let her know what she do is absolutely haram. Um, I don't know. I'll sit down with the imams and ask exactly how to. It's very tough. It's very difficult because. Sometimes you worry that the other children will also be impacted and affected. Uh, should you ostracize them uh, for a while or till they get to their senses? Hello, Alam. I just wanted to go back to the heart of the matter. Sometimes we make mistakes. And when we see one of our brother Muslim, his uh, son is on a drug or homosexual and we talk, be afraid that Allah will make your son or daughter. Be careful. That is the heart of the matter. Wallahi al-Azim, even if you say that he is rich and he is not donating to the masjid, 
that is going to affect you, affect your children. There are a lot of diseases outside. And they are trying to say this is genetics. You know that? But last uh, publication in science, they said no. It is not genetics. It is environmental. It's, you can adapt that. And so there is hope for those people that we can uh, you know, educate them and, and, and talk to them. And the most important thing for your children, open your heart. If you don't open your heart to them, they go. If you are going to be angry on them and shout at them, they will leave the house and they be worse. Last time I gave khutbah in uh, UFM, Dearborn. After the khutbah, a young guy came to me and he said, Alhamdulillah, I prayed Jum'ah, but they don't let me enter the masjid. I said, why? He said, because I'm a gay, a Muslim gay. So I said, SubhanAllah, maybe when he enters, when he listens to the khutbah, maybe he can change. Because we believe that changeable. It is not genetics. Just a quick uh, comment again. I found that 62% of our Muslim, young Muslims at universities have absolutely no problem with this. Um, we are putting together a workshop through the American Muslim Leadership Council to discuss these issues. In the Imam's Council this past Wednesday, we discussed it. So we really need to get Muslims together to see how to deal with these different situations. So I think we must keep you posted about that. It's an issue that's going to affect each and every one of us at one point in time. May Allah protect us. It's not Allah's only in America, by the way. It is not yeah. only in America. In Allah fact, is. the International Monetary Fund gives funding to African nations and force them to endorse uh, sexual homosexual unions. So they even enforce it, they, even if it's still here, a uh, professor. You have to change. I, I don't, yeah. I also think, just as a correction there, we also need those rituals. But how do we restore and bring back the soul? So it's not the either or thing. We, we need that. But you are correct. Uh, those mentorships should start very young. But some of these churches, like Kensington Church, having small groups of seven families getting together, and discussing it regularly, we need to really adopt that and uh, and uh, use your talent and, and uh, get that together. Allah SWT bless you all. We can end up with Asri in the Sun and the Khusr. I know it's not a hard one to ask.